Good evening, everybody. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Judy Khan, and I'm the Joint Head of Garden Court Chambers. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Garden Court Criminal Defence Team to this, our second in a series of webinars looking at drill music and gang evidence uh, and in the context of criminal proceedings. Uh, I think those of you who saw the last webinar will, uh, will agree that it was a really fascinating and helpful uh, webinar and it had um, unprecedented levels of attendance. And it's not difficult to understand why that should be the case because those of us who practice in criminal courts understand that this type of evidence is more frequently being deployed or, or sought to be deployed by the prosecution. Sometimes this kind of evidence can be focused on the issues and can be relevant to the issues. But all too frequently, we're seeing that this kind of evidence is being misused. It's being introduced in a way that does little more than reinforce negative uh, stereotypes rather than focusing on the issues that actually arise in the case. And so this seminar looks at challenging the admissibility of drill music in criminal trials. And we have four panel members to speak today. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them when they actually, and immediately before they speak. And whilst we're conducting the seminar, there is also a question and answer uh, panel, which uh, means that you can ask questions, which hopefully we'll get to at the end of the session. And we'll deal with it in that way to make sure that every speaker has an opportunity to complete what they have to say. Some of the questions may be answered by people as they um, deliver their, their part of the webinar. And so it makes sense to deal with those questions and answers at the end. Um, so I'm going to ask for us to kick off with Eleanor Papa Michael. I'm just going to tell you a bit about Eleanor. Eleanor is a solicitor and a higher court advocate at GT Stewart. Uh, she specialises in criminal defence and youth justice. And Eleanor has successfully defended young people and indeed adults across an array of criminal offences, including very recently representing people who were charged in the context of the Blacks, Black Lives Matter uh, activism. Uh, Eleanor has written several articles on topics such as youth justice and drill music and a piece that she uh, wrote was published in the Times last year. Uh, Eleanor uh, was a mentor at a youth project for several years and she's currently the chair of the and director of Forefront, a social enterprise which seeks to tackle the root causes of youth violence. And so Eleanor is going to kick us off with our webinar. So over to you, Elna, and I'll put myself on mute. Thank you, Judy. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for me tonight. So in speaking about challenging the admissibility of drill music in criminal trials, I think a good starting point is to say that it might be naive to try to argue that drill music isn't sometimes shocking in its content. And going further, I think it's also fair to say that drill music is sometimes deliberately highly provocative with its lyrics and its visuals. Drill music has been known to contain descriptions of stabbings and shootings and even mourning mothers. And the performers are often wearing balaclavas or other face masks. But I think um, it's really important to recognize that this is what gets the views and the streams and the online attention and it's been touched upon that making drill music can be a way for young men from disadvantaged backgrounds to make a career. But I really don't think that this can be um, overemphasized because, in fact, these artists are often achieving millions of views on YouTube. And they don't usually have connections within the music world, which is notoriously difficult to break into. And yet, because of all that attention that they generate, major record labels are often rushing to offer lucrative record deals. And so I think leaving aside for a moment whether they are actually doing what they say that they're, they're doing, there's a real element of supply and demand from all, all sorts of consumers as well. So uni students and young people from all over the UK um, who are often entirely removed from the type of lives that are being represented in, in that music. Um, and so there's an element of these artists tailor making a product so successfully that labels want to spend money on them. And so I think that we have to recognize that young people, um, 
these young people are social media and digital marketing geniuses. So yes, the lyrics can be ultra violent. Um, and I don't think that there's a way of getting away from that really. Do I think that that mounts an issue in our objectives as defense lawyers? Well, n not necessarily in my view. And that's really because making that music doesn't mean a, a, as a bottom line that someone is personally involved in serious youth violence. And that's something that I just want to expand on um, today. So many of you uh, perhaps will agree that there's been an increase in focus in the media on stabbings in the last few years. And, and those in criminal, involved in criminal justice um, uh, may agree that this has filtered down into policing and in the courtroom in lots of ways um, that are probably too numerous to talk about now. But perhaps most relevant to today's topic is that, well, in my practice, I've personally noticed a large increase in the number of C CBO applications, criminal behavior order applications, and gang injunction applications being brought. Um, and I think it's really important as defense lawyers that we're prepared to fight against the admission of drill music in order to support those ap applications and that we have the knowledge and the tools to do so. And I think at the heart of this is to examine just how probative most of these videos and these lyrics really are. And I think that what's happened in the media and the collective consciousness is that serious youth violence has become synonymous with gang membership. And drill music has become the visual representation of gang membership. And consequently, young black men are what often comes to mind when we think about and we talk about serious youth violence. And so the whole discussion about serious youth violence and policy and the way that it's policed is incredibly racialized. And I think there's many fallacies with this line of thinking. And I hope that we can, as defense lawyers, begin to deconstruct that association between serious youth violence, gangs and black culture. The word gang is used so much in the media and by the police and it makes its way into court in bail applications and as this kind of phantom in criminal trials. Um, but what, what does that word gang really mean? Well, we know that the word is usually used to describe young black men with 80% of those recorded on the gang matrix are um, black. But we also know that gangs account for only a very small percentage of the total of serious youth violence. And only 27% of those responsible for serious youth violence are black. But despite this, there's, ele the, there's elements of black culture that are really within the police's crosshairs and the focus of the media as a means of tackling serious youth violence. And if we look outside of London, Youth culture, as far as I'm aware, is not scrutinised in other cities with high stabbing rates, um, such as certain cities in Wales and in Glasgow. And again, I can't speak on policing on the ground in those cities, but in London, police are routinely presenting drill music as evidence of gang membership. And then as a natural conclusion, gang membership is being conflated with involvement with serious violent crime. And I'm seeing more and more criminal behaviour order applications being attached to a whole host of criminal charges, regardless of whether that individual has ever been convicted or even accused of a violent crime. And in support of those applications, police will assert that the individual is a gang nominal often. And this is evidenced by YouTube videos and um, often other police intelligence, which is often as flimsy as negative stop and searches when nothing is found or being seen with another alleged gang nominal. And so I think a key question for the courts and therefore us as defence lawyers is, are these lyrics and these videos evidence involvement in gangs or involvement in violent crime? I'd like to just use a drill artist who I represented. Um, to demonstrate kind of what I've been talking about so far. So this artist is signed to a, a major record label. And behavior order. In support of the application, they used lyrics from YouTube videos that he's in. 
Now, in those videos, he isn't necessarily the one rapping those lyrics because everyone is masked, and so the police don't exactly know which one. And the police also use mentions of his artist name in the lyrics of other artists. He was referred to... Um, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you, and it, we've got the screen share up, which threw, threw me, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so... We're not quite there yet, though, Amy, sorry. <laughs> um, so in that application, he was referred to as one of the most prominent members of a gang, a particular gang. And in fact, he was associated with the gang because of the area he grew up in, um, because he's one of the most talented artists, and therefore the most famous of the individuals associated with that area. But the police saw that as the equivalent of being a top-ranking gang member. And this kind of inaccurate assertion can often go unchallenged in a courtroom. And that's because I think nobody, whether that's the defence lawyer or the judge, really understands the workings of gang membership or association or how this music is being used or received. So, for example, studies show that active gang membership for young people is usually quite transient and being associated with a gang due to being from a certain or going to a particular school doesn't mean that you're actively involved in gang crime. So, for example, if you're a drill artist and you're from Camberwell, you might be associated with Moscow 17. And if you're a drill artist from Peckham, you might be associated with Zone 2. That doesn't mean, necessarily, that you're out committing violent offences for that group or that gang. I read statements from police officers, YouTube videos, where um, the individuals are... Um, um, gesticulating in um, rap and the conclusion from that officer a supposed expert is that gun thing that that's gun fingers and this means that a young person um, is involved in violence and this cultural blindness to put it mildly or anti-black racism to perhaps put it more accurately really leads to oh um injustice within the justice system I think another issue in relation to gang membership that I want to brief, raise, raise briefly is how being a victim of violent crime um, is being conflated with gang membership often. And that's often in a very racialized way. So where there are victims of robberies and stabbings in a certain area, they can be entered into the gang matrix as a result of this incident. Another example of life in Canada is a young recalled to prison for not having identified their attacker. And so there seems to be this presumption that they must be involved in crime themselves, which often is supported by any hard evidence. And I think that that's codified to some extent by the Policing and Crime Act 2009, which of course is the gang injunction. And that can be imposed to prevent the respondent from engaging in gang-related violence, the violence themselves. So, um, this is the point there I just wanted to show you two sets of lyrics from two songs both of those um, are drill one is in the UK charts at number five so we can presume he's not actively involved in violent crime and the other is from a group that the police would say is a gang so, um, Amy, if you could just share that. Yes, thank you. So that's the first one. Hopefully you've had a chance to read that. And then if Amy you could just show the next one. So we were hopeful going one uh, um but no poll um perhaps we could just have anyone who thinks they might know the answer in the um chat section i don't really know what's going on there A 
don't know if you can see, Eleanor, we're getting some answers through. Yeah, I can. One person's opted for the first group as a gang. I think one of the other candidates said the second group was a gang. Yeah, so there's, there's a mixture. And I think the point, hopefully, that I'm successfully demonstrating is that um, they're very similar um, in content. Um, and um, uh, I think, hopefully, this shows that sometimes we get caught up in the morality of the content of the lyrics. Um, but looking at it as lawyers, what is the probative value of bringing those lyrics into the courtroom? Um, and what do they prove? And often that they prove very little when the lyrics, as we can see, can be almost indistinguishable from to chart music. And so for a jury or magistrates or a judge who, who doesn't have that cultural awareness to listen to those lyrics um, in context and viewing this scary violent imagery and, and scary violent lyrics, that can be highly prejudicial. So um, I think the takeaway point, hopefully, from this is that we as defence lawyers have to try to resist the tide change of music and YouTube videos being routinely brought into the criminal arena and hopefully understanding the ways in which police expert evidence or so-called about drill music might be inaccurate or misleading will be in a better place to challenge the admissibility of that evidence um, and hopefully be better equipped to show the courts that some of these um, police drill experts aren't expert and, and aren't in instructing our own suitably experienced experts um, to support the defence submissions to that effect. Um, Thank you very much, Helen. I think you might have frozen uh, again oh, now. I'm, okay. I'm going to ask Amy to take down the um, lyrics because we've uh, we've carried out that exercise, and I um, I think that there was a broad mix of responses, which, as you've said, demonstrates the point that these types of lyrics are commonplace, and it doesn't necessarily signal gang membership or indeed involvement in serious violence, and it really demonstrates the dangers of this kind of material. Um, and I'm just going to ask you, it's a very short question, so I'm going to ask it before we move on to Kieran. Um, Sandra has asked whether we could clarify if gang membership um, is presented in bail hearings, um, and she says, brackets, magistrates court or in trial or in both. And I, don't, um, I haven't done a magistrates court trial for a, a little while now, but um, certainly in bail applications, uh, it's routinely introduced and there's a much lower bar I think we'd all agree because they can rely on what's um, referred to often as intelligence evidence so it's not evidence that would be capable of admissibility in a trial but it's often admitted on the the hearsay uh, perhaps multiple hearsay from police officers so that's certainly my experience in terms of bail applications I don't know Eleanor whether you would share that um, experience Yes, I completely agree. And often if it's a first appearance at the magistrate's call, it will be referred to just the MG5, which is a case summary, which isn't even, it's one step even more. It just disappears um, in a, um, and, and will form part of the um, tribunal's decision um, to, grant, to grant bail. And we as defence lawyers, um, it's very difficult to uh, go to, to challenge that or go behind that when it just appears um, as a phrase in a, in a, in a document um, without any evidence to, yeah. to support it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, and we're going to hear now from um, Kieran. And I'm going to ask Kieran to unmute himself, the, the, um, the common mistake that we all make of not doing. But um, before he speaks, I just wanted to introduce him. Kieran is a youth worker, a journalist, and he's a founder of a charity called Roadworks. Uh, it's an education charity which uses contemporary music to engage with young people who are at risk of exclusion and um, violence. And Kieran has also spoken about the links between musical expression and youth violence in both Houses of Parliament. Uh, his first book, Cut Short, um, signalling that there are other books perhaps planned in the pipeline, his first book is due for publication in... Um, spring of next year so I'm sure we'll all look out for that 
Uh, and the, the nice thing about hearing from Kieran is it, it's a, a sort of non-legalistic look at drill music and the positive aspects of drill music in particular. So thank you, Kieran, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. So um, just to explain a bit about why I'm here and talking, I think it's important to um, highlight that. Um, so I'm a, I'm a youth worker and a writer sort of in equal measure, and that's been the case for about five years. Um, I've done that in South London, in Brixton, but I've worked all over London with young people. Um, and written about different communities across London. Um, the reason that drill has become a sort of nexus point for my, a lot of my work, both as a youth worker and as a writer, is because um, when I was becoming a youth worker in the early sort of, um, in the early years of my work, when I, in 2015, 2016, when drill was basically a, a really, really hyper-local phenomenon in South London. Um, barely anyone knew about it apart from the people making it and sort of listening to it in community. Um, I just happened to be working with young people who were doing that. And so I sort of stumbled upon it as a music fan, as a youth worker, and as someone interested in this very powerful, um, rich form of expression. Um, and because I was working with a demographic, a demographic of young person um, who were... Uh, at risk of violence and exclusion. It became a really, really powerful, useful tool um, for me to create dialogues with young people. And so literally from the very kind of first instance of me discovering the music, I started using it in a constructive way to create educational opportunities. So that's where it really the starting point and it, and it remains my main priority. When I talk about drill and I write about it, that remains the priority. Um, I then written quite extensively and interviewed um, large chunks of the drill scene and the sort of London rap scene in general. Um, and that goes from rappers, producers, um, videographers, managers, people that run YouTube platforms, um, really trying to understand and represent um, this very rich, successful, um, and also um, in many ways therapeutic art form that's come out of London um, and come out of a particular context in London that I think is largely driven by a lot of injustice and, and sort of hidden trauma. Um, so my youth work and my writing have sort of had, have interplayed um, and they feed into one another, which is why I'm, I'm sat here being able to represent hopefully young people and practitioners on the ground. Um, as a result of um, that practice, and I, again, I've been a youth worker in, in schools across London, um, in, youth club, in youth clubs across London, in particular Marcus Lipton Community Centre in Brixton, um, and I've also worked in prisons as well. So I've sort of seen uh, the pipeline that takes place when you, you, you're working with an 11 or 12 year old young person, disproportionately male, um, and they're at risk of being excluded from school all the way up to uh, people in their early 20s who are imprisoned for uh, various um, minor offences as well as major ones. But the main connecting point being that those demographics all the way through are increasingly and have increasingly been making music that we're talking about now. And so um, as a result of all of those experiences and um, a result of three years of writing about it and then deciding that actually I was going to put more of my energy into um, trying to use that musical music industry position and um, my understanding of the context to put it more into youth working um, efforts. I founded Roadworks last summer. Um, so Roadworks, we use contemporary music um, as a way of connecting with young people in communities where violence is very prevalent. Um, and we've, we've done that in Pruse, um, we've created online resources for educators and parents. Um, we've had a great success and great pickup and we will hopefully will continue to do that over the next year. But the main sort of just uh, case study I want to draw from in our work is that I've worked with countless young people that make drill music. I've been, in, I've been sat in day long studio sessions whilst groups of young men have made drill music in front of me on 20, 30 different occasions. Um, I've mentored 10 to 20 young people who have made the music, who have appeared in music videos that I've attended the shoots of. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very, my work is very much intertwined with a lot of the, the music making and everything around it, as well as the sort of social lives of these young people. Uh, as a result, with Roadworks in particular, we've, we've taken up a sort of mentoring position. So we've, we've taken on some artists. Um, and, and really, the case study I wanted to use is, 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 is that one of the young men that I worked with, which I think is a really, really um, good example to use to, to sort of present the opposite end of the spectrum that I, sus I, I suspect that a lot of the public have um, a lot of the public have an impression that drill music represents a certain type of young person um, based on the fact that they're seeing this this aesthetic and this this um, 
sort of ostensibly violent and provocative content on their screens. But there's actually a whole complex world going on behind that. And um, what I found, and this is definitely at least 95% of young people I've worked with, um, and, and this in particular, this young person that I'm still mentoring now, he makes extremely violent drill music. He talks about all sorts of um, provocative things that he has seen, that people around him have done. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's, if you were listening to that music and you had no knowledge of the context in his life, you would watch those videos. And you, if you took them for, for his word for granted, you would think he was a criminal. But I know his family. I've written a uh, reference for job applications that he's done. I helped him write his personal statement for university. I used to work with him in his school and he used to come and sit next to me and we used to talk about philosophy. So I used to set him philosophical readings to do. He is not a criminal and he's not even close to being one. But because there is now a financial incentive and also a sort of cathartic incentive for young people who suddenly see this way of expressing themselves, of gaining credibility in their communities, of making money when there aren't other opportunities, people like him and countless other young people are using that model, using drill, but also rap and just music making um, to express themselves and try and enter into an ecosystem of becoming financially sustainable themselves in the face of poverty, in the face of other um, lacking opportunity areas. Um, so, so he's one example of many that I've seen where, yes, if you took these videos at face value, you see a certain world, but in order to understand it properly, you have to have the context of what's going on in the United Kingdom, uh, in particular, what's going on for young, poor, disproportionately black men in London. And it's just a fact of life that there is a nexus at which there are lots of different unjust points that have potentially not ever been as bad as they are now in terms of exclusion rates from school, in terms of rates of incarceration, in terms of the different tools that are being used in the criminal justice system, like the gang injunction, like gang nominals, like CBOs, that if they all pile up together on a young person's life, then they have no choice but to follow the certain patterns of that um, lifestyle that ends up being a norm in their communities. And often drill simply reflects that lack of choice. So it's a sort of forced survivalism of a lot of artists. Um, and the sort of common, the common arguments, I've, I've got three main points really uh, moving on from that, which is that there are three main points I always try to make when I say about the sort of positive potential of drill music, but also just music making in general in communities where there's not very many opportunities. Um, the first one I would say is a form of catharsis. So again, I said that I've been in studio sessions with young people who I know have habitually had knives pulled on them. Um, they've lost siblings, lost friends uh, to, to murder. Um, I have seen the process that takes place when someone writes lyrics, they step in the booth and then they step out of the booth. And it is one of catharsis. It's one of, yes, maybe not something that everyone in society wants to hear or finds peaceful or finds relaxing or finds interesting to hear. But for that young person, it's potentially a life-saving tool of expression. And obviously when you then add on another layer of that, which is that that catharsis not only performs a therapeutic function, it, it performs an educational function because I'm then able to have a conversation with them about their lyrics. I'm able to have, to have a conversation with them about the content of what they're saying and therefore about their lives. And because I've let them in the booth, because I've engaged with that culture, it means that there's an authenticity to the education I'm able to provide them. You then add another layer of the sort of livelihood potential. So the fact that Heady One, the fact that Unknown T, the fact that there are all these drill artists who have criminal records, who have controversial backgrounds, but nonetheless have been able to transcend their environments um, via this music form, not just as music makers, but the people and the teams around them, the social media marketers, the videographers, the people who are managing them. There's a whole ecosystem of people who are making jobs for themselves off the back of this music making, which is a process that has been happening for decades grime, before that with jungle, with rap, going back decades, but now it's become so lucrative and so um, effective as a way of transcending your environment, and an, an environment that's never been harsher for that demographic, that it becomes extremely powerful, not only as a form of therapy, but also as a form of earning money. The third thing is that I have spoken in both houses of parliament about drill. I've written in several major publications about drill. I have been invited on this 
uh, panel to talk about drill. There is uh, a high success rate of this music getting on people's radar. And so what has ended up happening is that the music, consciously or not, I'm not suggesting that the music is consciously political, but I'm suggesting that it has disturbed the discourse enough to get on people's radars and be like, we are experiencing this. We as a demographic are going through this trauma and we are telling you about it. And figures of authority, of course, they want to shut it down because that ha if they don't shut it down, that has to, we have to admit that there are these gaping inequalities and injustices that take place systemically in all areas of society. Um, so that's the third point. There's a sort of political potential to it, regardless of whether it's conscious or not. Um, and I think that just to sort of bring it back round to you know, why we're here, um, by using these music videos in criminal courts, it doesn't just stay to the courtroom, it trickles out into society. It, you know, that, that young person, whether they get sent to prison or not, or they go back to community, they go and tell their friends that these things have happened. And then their friends are suddenly like, oh, okay. So I've now got to make music that navigates around these measures, A, so it becomes more cryptic and harder to reach. And B, maybe actually they're having some success with their music career or their form of expression. And then they give up. Because they think, oh, you know what, it's just, there's no point with this anymore. I've seen it happen count countless times in conversations. Um, so it, it isn't just in the courtroom, it trickles out into society. Um, and I think that also on a, on a personal level, as an educator, um, I've, I've found a huge amount of potential to have an impact in young people's lives. I would say a life-saving life impact in, in many different lives. Um, and by criminalizing it in the courtroom, by criminalizing it in the media, by criminalizing it in schools implicitly when... Uh, drill music's banned from being played in classrooms, which happens. And um, when teachers confuse drill with grime and confuse drill with other types of hip hop because they don't understand the nuances between different types of black music, you end up having this huge block as an educator to connect with young people because they see you as, as automatically not taking them seriously. So I actually think it's very dangerous and, and irritating for me as an educator when these sorts of measures trickle out into society. Um, and just as a final point, um, which I'll just, I think is always worth mentioning, is that we as humans right now on this planet are all grappling with uh, trying to reconcile uh, our real lives with the need to present ourselves online. Everyone is doing that. Now, if you're a wealthy adult with lots of self-confidence and you've got qualifications and you've got a stable job and you're, you're housed and you've got lots of space, your ability to do that is much more relaxed, it's much more free. You can present a certain world for yourself online and it doesn't need to attach onto loads of incentives because you're fine. If you're a young person that's completely trapped in so many different ways, you don't have that same freedom. So drill really is a, is, is a musical manifestation of that, of that trapping. It's people using te technology available for them and presenting a certain world that's hopefully gonna get them paid, allow them to express themselves. So. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complex world going on behind the screen, basically, is my main point. But, um, yeah. Kieran, thanks a lot for that. Um, a couple of the comments that I've seen while you've been speaking. One person, um, Malcolm, says hats off to Kieran, and I'd echo that. And a uh, last comment um, from somebody saying it's a really interesting perspective, which it, it certainly is. And I think when we spoke earlier... I was telling you about some instances where this kind of evidence had been admitted in cases of mine. One where I could understand because it was effectively somebody after an incident in a kind of gang related um, tit for tat incident uh, posting a video effectively bragging about what had been an attack that had been carried out. And one can understand that that kind of almost confessional type material is, is focused on the issues. What well, What's more concerning when we were speaking was another example I gave you of somebody having a drill um, video admitted just because it demonstrated that he had an awareness of two types of firearms um, in a case where he, there, there were two types of firearms used and they weren't uncommon uh, firearms. So that, that's a real concern about the, the wide use that can be put to it. Can I just ask you this? Do you, I mean, obviously there's a great scope for positive, um, a positive impact from this music and involvement in this music. And it's a way of getting kids to engage when perhaps they feel disenfranchised. And I think that's a really valuable thing to, to have. But 
do you ever feel an anxiety about how this music can be misused when you when you have people who are recording in the studio do you ever do you ever feel that you ought to warn them about how they can and can't present themselves on it is is that an anxiety that you feel and how do you deal with it it's a good question and yet all the time i've been many sleepless nights sort of uh going over this question because um you know with roadworks in particular we've had lots of instances where we've had to um really grapple with if we are saying it's okay for you to say these things when you step into the booth or when you write your lyrics is that sending a message that we think that what you're saying, the actions that you're describing is ethically acceptable? Um, and I think the answer to that has to be, and this is my general position, is that you have to let them get it out and then you have critical conversations. But if you don't let them get it out in the first place, it's in their head. It's staying in their head. And then who knows where it's going to go from there. And I know that there are lots of, you know, teachers aren't having those conversations in general. Um, and youth, you know, youth services have been decimated. Um, that there, there are only a few really fully functional youth clubs, and and there's, they're not always fully prepared or, or trained in order to have those conversations as well. So I think, yeah, I think it's um, there's always a tension, and I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. You know, just to just to be clear, I've I'm very close to young people who have lost brothers and etc. To people that could easily have had drill music played in their court. So I'm not I'm not dismissing its darkness and its um, it's, it's massive spectrum. I'm just saying that from my experience, that represents a real, a real minority when it's been made out to be a majority. And, and I think that, yeah, the, the, there is a tension, but I think there's a way around it. And also there's a tension just in life right now with the fact that the world is violent. So we have to grapple with that. And if you try and sweep it under the carpet, it's just going to get worse. So, yeah. Thank you, Kieran. Um, Hannah asked a question, which I think to an extent you've answered, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to the next speaker and then um, we may come back to uh, consider that and I'll let Kieran read the comment, um, read the question and answer. I think you've got access to that too. So we'll come back to answer that question later. We're next going to hear from Stella Harris, who's a barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Um, Stella's committed to representing young people. She represents people across the spectrum of violent offences quite often, um, allegations of murder and lesser allegations too quite often involving uh, gang evidence and quite often involving gang videos. Uh, Stella assisted the Howard League for Penal Reform in making submissions both orally and in writing to the DPP um, regarding reform of the, the CPS guidelines on charging in joint enterprise cases, which of course also very often uh, go, run side by side with the, these types of issues. Uh, and so, Quite often, Stella has been involved in her practice in seeking to exclude evidence of, of drill music and or gang affiliation. And so Stella's going to give us some interesting case studies uh, to, to give us some insight into how this type of evidence can be admitted and or can be challenged. Over to you, Stella. Thank you, Judy. Um... I hope everybody has got um, a handout that we provided. And uh, David, I think that that's, um, we're going to look at both a handout and a case study, um, which we're going to look at in a moment, David. So that I'll, I'll ask you to pull that screen up in a moment, please. Um, thank you. The, um, the handout is something that you really you can reference at home and in your own time, but a few matters just really to set out some cases that we found that were interesting and illustrative of some of the um, the issues that we've been grappling with and looking at in preparing this series. Uh, and to be clear and to pick up on something that Judy has just said about um, the sort of confessional um, material, this isn't a, a complaint necessarily about specific and directed and probative evidence what it is is it's a, a very heavy health warning um, about the prejudicial impact of this material in trials um, this material uh, that was a question in our last session about whether involvement in drill music is bad character in and of itself 
Um, is it right to even look at this sort of evidence as bad character? And I think that there's some, th some very real force in what is said about that for all of the reasons, really, that Kieran has explained to us about um, the use of... Um, drill music by young people and we must always look at and go back to sort of those youth justice principles when we consider this sort of um, evidence but one thing that is helpful when we look at um, character is that under the criminal justice act 2003 which is how this evidence would go in uh, there are safeguards for any person so the Crown, it's usually the Crown, would make an application for the case, for the evidence to go in. And the court has to be satisfied about that. So um, on your legal gateway section of, this, of the, um, just to, so that you've got the reference point, section 98 is where uh, evidence falls out of the, of the bad character provisions because it's to do with the facts of the case. So it might be, for example, the prosecution say it's motivation or it's background material or it's very much intertwined evidentially with their allegation. If that is not bad character, the only mechanism that we as lawyers can use to exclude that evidence is under Section 78 of the uh, Police and Criminal Evidence Act. And sort of going back to our sort of law school days, the discretion there is not a must but a may. So the judge may refuse that evidence um, if it has such an adverse impact on the fairness of the proceedings that a court ought not to admit it. If, with this, if this material falls within bad character, then we've got a different set of criteria because it has to be explore, important explanatory evidence. There's plainly a, a crossover there but it has to really assist the jury in a material way in their understanding of the case. And when we come on to look at the case study that I've um, prepared, um, we can have a look at what that really goes to in a, in a real factual case. But effectively, it means it's impossible to understand the case otherwise. And um, when we look at um, the bad character evidence in respect of that, um, the fairness provisions must be that it must not be be admitted um, and unless it has um, because it might have such an adverse effect on the fairness of the proceedings that the court not to admit it so it's an absolute direction to the judge that if it's prejudicial and um, is shedding more darkness than light on the evidence in the case it mustn't go in um, we've had a look at some cases um, for you all to use um, Drill and rap lyrics feature in quite a lot of um, Court of Appeal judgments that this evidence is quite re routinely used. Um, one thing that um, those of us who undertake appellate work find difficult to convey to the Court of Appeal is the nature of trial proceedings. So trials, and this is why we are privileged and enjoy our jobs very much, are living and breathing real events with people and witnesses they have an atmosphere the way that evidence goes down they it's very very difficult to recreate injustices in the court of appeal and to really really convey the prejudicial impact particularly of visual material of young people ballied up dark violent imagery upon a jury and the mindset of a jury now, those of us who practice in criminal law trust juries. Um, we, uh, this is a central feature of our system and we have a great deal of faith in them. But um, we want juries to make the, the decisions with the material that enables them to make a fair and proper assessment of the case and, and reach the right conclusions. So um, the cases that we've highlighted, um, there's a, a case called Salim. This is a 2007 case. It really just tells us that we've got to always forensically look. This is a case about being to do with um, the facts of the case and so not a bad character case per se, that we've always got to be forensically aware. So this was some lyrics that were actually written months and months before these events. Um, 
we have to look and, and be careful about admitting that sort of evidence because how does it assist a jury? The two examples that I would draw to your attention um, is, are two cases. The one is called O. It was reported in 2010. And um, unfortunately, things have not got much better in uh, the case of Rashid, which was uh, reported last year. In both of those cases, um, evidence of a police constable, so a relatively junior police officer, in the case of Rashid, of three years experience in policing um, in that locality, gave evidence about the admissibility of um, drill lyrics and involvement in videos that they described as being as, as, uh, denoting gang membership and also interpreted the evidence um, and the lyrics. The court's attitude in the first instance were these were matters that could be subject to cross-examination. They were matters within the jury's remit and the jury could decide whether this was art or um, whether this was um, demonstrative of real life lived experiences and effectively a confession. Um, in one of those cases, the um, council challenged the admissibility of that evidence and the um, court's comment about that was um, that uh, the person, um, the police officer, was able, because they were a local person, to interpret um, the patois of South London and um, because, in effect, that person, that officer, had... Um, police that area, they were able to interpret the lives, the lyrics and the music created by people who live there. The, um, what, of course, I can't get behind is how, what the experience of that police officer actually was of the people who lived in that area. Um, but she, her primary experience appears to be policing that area. And the similar situation in the case of Rashid that evidence was looked at in, in a, on a voir dire, but in that in instance, there wasn't a challenge um, commented upon by the Court of Appeal of that uh, officer's experience and expertise. Uh, and one thing that we really want to draw to your attention is that there are experts out there, such as Kieran, such as the academic experts that we heard in our first um, seminar, who are able to contextualise this type of lyrics, who are able to explain it. And um, there are const constraints, there are figures, there are motifs within the evidence, uh, with this sort of evidence that do require uh, that input. And with that input, if this evidence is admitted, the jury have a better opportunity to fairly assess its probative weight. Um, so those are, the, those are the cases that are on the perhaps a more depressing end of the picture. But there is, um, within the cases that we've highlighted, a case called El Alimi, which is um, an authority that um, was um, considered by the Court of Appeal in 2014 by um, the counsel in that case is Arlette Piercy, who's, at, um, who's in Chambers in London, and she... Um, successfully argued as a triumph of common sense really against the admissibility of two rap videos and we've put the we've put the um the details in the handout for you to have a look at them they're quite interesting actually because they do have a lot um, having watched them um they do have a lot of the symbolism and um features of videos that we would commonly have to encounter but, but the the young man in those cases in that case was effectively an extra in those videos. So he was um, sitting in a car, being driven about, um, standing in the background, swaying to the music, and that sort of thing. But really, very much in in the peripheries, not rapping himself, not talking about. Um, gang related or weaponry or any of that nature, albeit that some of the subject matter of the um, the lyrics was in, in to that um, to that way, but um, a very interesting case. And one thing um, 
the, so the court actually quashed the, the conviction in respect of that case. It was a, a shooting um, and they quashed his conviction. It was admissible against co-defendants, but, it, but the court considered that the jury should have been, ex had it explained to them that his involvement in that really didn't assist them at all in the decisions that they were making. So a very interesting um, a case, a, a bit of a positive approach from the Court of Appeal, common sense. Um, and one feature of the case that's um, interesting and sort of leads me to something that we were discussing before this seminar with Kieran was the, the way that videos are often made. And this was part of um, Miss Pierce's submissions in the Court of Appeal, because sometimes what will happen is the video is actually shot before any of the music or the track is put next to it. Sometimes the lyrics are actually not spoken while the um, video director is obtaining the background footage that adds to the texture of the video. And so somebody who is effectively in the back of a video, walking along in a stairwell, whatever it might be, might actually not know in real, in real terms what is going to be the feature of the full, the full video. So a really interesting practical aspect of the case to also consider. So that, that's those um, cases along with others are in the handout. Um, there's some um, quotes there that help us to sort of understand the approach of the Court of Appeal, often obviously looking at cases on a, a case by case um, basis. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to move on to talk to you about a case study. And this is a case, this is effectively three or four cases that I have been involved in that I have put together so that um, uh, it's not really touching on the, the sensitive facts of any particular of those cases but to be illustrative of some of the things that we're going to be looking at as practitioners when we're um, considering the applications in respect of, of drill music. I should say before I look at this that going back to the case of Alimi and also just in respect to this, these cases are often involving a joint enterprise. So they're involving groups of people and in respect of co-defendants, it is always worth being aware that as soon as that the admissibility criteria is met, the fairness aspect is not, a, is not actually a feature in respect of co-defendants in the statute. So we always have to be very aware or in, in a multi-handed case about what co-defendants are uh, and what use co-defendants might be using and also be aware that we might need to explain lyrics or contextualise them because th those sorts of applications might be coming from that side. So um, this is the case study. Um, R is a 15-year-old boy. He's charged with murder. He has been excluded from school because he'd taken a knife to school and um, he has support, a supportive family. His dad has told you that he's been bullied at school and the reason that he carried the knife was that he'd been, he'd been ex, um, experiencing some threats on social media, so on Snapchat. His mum says that they were, as a family, were quite worried about the people who were hanging around waiting for him when he came out of school. Um, he accepted possession of that knife in the youth court and he's re received a referral order. He's got no other findings of guilt, but the referral order means that he is under supervision of the youth offending service. So, David, if we could just go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, he's six feet tall. His family have encouraged him to train in martial arts to gain his confidence. He enjoys listening to and making music and via his mentor, he's had access to a recording studio and he's going to record some drill beats. So this is the production side of drill music, the beat being uh, one of the identifying features of this genre. The case involves a stabbing in a park near to where he lives. There's a group of people involved and all of them are wearing dark clothing. Many have their faces covered. And the deceased is an older teenager. Witnesses describe at least one knife within the group. The injuries are consistent with at least one knife. So we don't know how many knives are in the group, but there's at least at least one, um, poss the possibility of more. Thank you, David. If we just have a look at the next slide. The Crown's kept, oh, sorry, one, one back, please. So the Crown's case is that he's present and part of the group that attacked the deceased. They cannot say one way or the other if he had a weapon. 
of note when you look at the CCTV, not everyone who is present is participating in the violence. The person who's identified as R is, seems to be on the peripheries of the incident. The police have undertaken telephone analysis. They place a phone that is linked to him at the scene. It's his mum's phone. Phones in communication with other phones after the killing that are of interest and is switched off a few hours later. He's arrested some weeks later. There's no forensic evidence. Some items of clothing are seized. Thank you, David. Um, the Crown's case is that the killing is motivated by gang violence. They say he's associated with a gang called Green Gang. I've just made, um, made a Green Gang. There's a, um, another deceased. Although he's not a gang member, he's associated because of where he lives with the Red Gang. There's a history of violence between the two groups. He says he knows some, um, your client says that he knows some members of the Green Gang because of where he lives. Um, but he's not wasn't involved in the violence he didn't know what others were going to do so the crown make a bad character application to adduce three pieces of evidence the first is a memorial video it relates to a, um, a young victim of a stabbing um, um, in which um, R is appears he's not covered or anything like that a drill video um, by a relatively prominent local artist in which the crown say that they can identify R. Oh, this is where his clothing comes in in the background and his build. Um, they say in that that there's allegiance pledged to the local area. They describe it as a diss track. It makes reference to weapons and violence. Um, and they rely on a police expert who's translated it and interpreted the lyrics and the rivalries to give evidence in the trial. The lyrics, um, then the final piece is a lyrics found during a police search of R's home, which refer to the deceased mum being very upset and crying. So those are the features. I'm just, can we just have a look at the final slide, David, and then move back to the start, please? So the Crown seek to use these pieces of evidence to show that R was affiliated with a gang, that he associates with people who have got connections with it and habitually carry weapons, and therefore that, they, that, the people, that he would have known the people in the group that he was with on the night of the killing had weapons with them and might have used them. Um, they also say that the lyrics demonstrate um, uh, that um, allegiance and uh, also a callous attitude towards the deceased and his associates. So um, if we could just go back to the beginning of the slides, um, I'm just going to make a few points that, of, of, is of issues that you might want to think about. Obviously, um, speaking to people who, who um, are involved, and this is very much a discussion so I'm not saying I know all the answers, far, far from it, but um, just some ideas really for you. So because R is um, 15, what we, um, what we know is that um, we have to look really at the um, youth justice principle. So we can't talk about drill unless we talk about young people. Um, and um, we also often can't talk about drill unless we talk about school exclusion um, because as Kieran has told us and it's certainly I've seen it a number of times in practice um, efforts are made to engage young people who do feel themselves out outside of the education system out, via the medium of music um, what we want to be doing in respect of um, are, is we want to be making sure that this trial um, is centred around his age. He's a very young person, um, so we want to make sure that he can properly participate in the trial. We want to make sure that um, we make any modifications that are needed to make sure that he can, he can do so properly. And so what we want to be doing is we want to be obtaining some obsess assessments about him. We know he's out of school. We want to be looking at psychological assessments, we want speech and language assessments. We want to know who we are representing. We want to understand this young person and their life. Um, what we often find is that when we come to deal with sentence, there is a great deal of understanding, especially in the Court of Appeal, around vulnerabilities of young people, um, their role in group events, the way that the adolescent brain develops, 
issues around maturity, but we've got to make sure that they have those considerations are front and centre in a trial. Um, we want to be looking at getting his school records because if the Crowner want to put in that possession of the knife, we want to be able to explain to a jury and tell this young man's story. We maybe want to be looking, speaking to his youth offending team worker. We want to be looking to see whether they've made any um, referral to the national um, referral mechanism. We want to know who this person is and we want to know, be speaking to the family if we have his permission and getting a full history about him so that if he's giving evidence, we have it all there, we can tell his story. So um, thank you, David. If we move on to the next slide, please. Um, the first line I, I've included because um, I represented a young man and no colleagues have as well, who was extremely tall for, and, and undertook martial arts and was 14 years old. And it, you had to remind yourself that he was a child. He looked like an adult man. And I think that what we have to always remember, and it's been especially prevalent when you're dealing with young black men, is that there is an idea that they are older than their years and that they are somehow adult. Um, and we have to be alive to that. And we have to make sure that we ensure that the, the jury and everybody understands that however he looks, he's still a young, very young child. Um, I've put in that he enjoys making music. He's actually into the production side, as you can see, because he's making the beats of this. And you know, Kieran's input, that sort of input is very important, again, to contextualise why he's interested in the music, what, he, what he's doing. Um, this case is going to involve some identification issues, as we can see, about who is who within the park because of some of the way that people are described. Uh, and, I, uh, and those issues might centre as well about who has a weapon. Um, but if we look over at the next slide, please, David. Um, uh, what we know is that R is in the CCTV, but is on the edges of this incident. So we're going to, all, obviously, all the joint enterprise considerations about um, participation, what he can for, reasonably foresee might happen within his age um, need to be considered we have other um that's obviously a huge topic um and uh, one that's going to be touched upon later in the series um the police have, tele have undertaken some telephone analysis analysis he switched off his phone after work, after this he's been in touch with people that isn't always uh, indicative of um guilt or a strong case against somebody we have to remember that this is a child this is a frightening event to be involved in if you are involved or even if you've witnessed it and panic may mean that someone switches off their phone um, it's about exp an explanation isn't it and he's arrested some time later so there are no other evidence about this okay so let's see what he has to say if we just turn over to the next slide um, he tells you um, that he um, is present and he says, tells, so there isn't, you know, he, we know he's there. Um, and he no says that he knows some people from this group because of, he lives in the local area. So um, his association and his presence are not going to be issues in this trial. The jury are going to know those things. They're not going to be um, an issue. So that really brings us to the Crown's application and whether or not it is probative and whether its contents are going to help this jury to make the right decision um, whether and a fair decision. So if we have a look at the memorial video, um, this is taken from a, from a real example that, that I have seen. Um, in that example, in fact, there was a slightly closer connection to the case and so we admitted some of this video, but not, we didn't play it in court. We, had, we agreed a fact about it. But the video itself was um, quite sober in and somber in tone. It had people of all ages, women, children. No one had their faces covered. And it was very much a memorial about the young person who died. Um, in this case, um, it doesn't really take facts any further, but it's worth 
always being alive to the fact that perhaps if something is significant or may have some part to play in the case that an agreed fact about it such as he was in standing in the back of a video that was a memorial to so and so on this day um will will satisfy everybody and be fair um the drill video in the middle is um is perhaps the more problematic really it requires an analysis of what's in the video what's in the lyrics and what's in the video but if the lyrics are totally atypical of drill, um, they're in their context, they are something that can be explained. That's really where we want to be challenging and looking at the expertise of the police evidence. And we want to be instructing our own experts to give the other side. And probably what we want to do in respect of this is we want to do this at, the, at half time. So at the close of the Crown's case, when the shape of the case is understood by everybody what's the sort of evidential picture making sure that we're not propping up a weak case against um uh, by the crown against our client we want to then have a look at this properly with time and i think what what often happens at court is we're all under pressure we receive material late often we're firefighting that material we might be starting a trial and the crown want to open something and we're all sort of rushed into making these applications and dealing with them and this is something that takes time it's very significant and you probably want to be looking to call some of this evidence so the judge can make the proper assessment of its evidential impact its probative impact um, and prejudicial effects in the trial um, particularly, for example, um, suggestions that things are distracts. The fact that somebody is standing on effectively their doorstep with people they're at school with, um, saying that they, they, they like where they live in real terms, that that's where they feel secure and safe, that's not a distract. We need to look at the, and, and really unpack um, this, we also need to really unpack um, the crime reports, the Chris reports that speak to these rivalries, we really need to forensically look at what the Crown are saying. Um, we need to be very alive to suggestions that simply because one person within a group is carrying a knife, that that means everybody are a homogenous group, that everybody um, would know each other carries knives. That stereotype, that racist stereotype, frankly, of young black men carrying knives we've got to challenge that because simply because one person carries a knife does not mean everybody else knows that they have it and really there are other evidence we can look at here so we can look at the co-defendants the levels of contact between these people how do well do we know one another are we really good friends we can find that out from the other um, material in the case um, we can use that, um, that evidence, real evidence. Have we been stopped together? Are we on the gang matrix? Which is very problematic in itself. Um, what evidence is it that we associate with, with people who are violent or associate with other people in the case? You know, are we around each other's houses all the time? Are we calling each other day and night? Or do we not know each other so well? Um, very important with someone like R, oh, who's kind of on the edges of a group, affiliated, living in the area, to really drill down, so to speak, and find out what that, what that means. Finally, we've got some lyrics in the house. Um, they refer to um, mother of the deceased crying. Um, this is actually a motif in many of many songs um, started some years ago, but it's quite common to see this kind of lyric. It appears very callous and unkind, but it's, it, is, it is commonly seen in drill case, um, drill, drill music. And sometimes, it uh, depends obviously what else is found, there will be other material around the pain and loss, um, speaking about loss within within the community so it's really important to also look at what else has been found on the phone what else other lyrics have been found so th those are really the the issues that that i've identified um for you um i'd be interested to see what your what your views are about the about the items that i've identified just to give you this the sort of the the situation the memorial video as i've said did go in but by agreement in the end because we recognized that it had some features that were important 
um, but was, a, was reduced to an agreed fact. The, um, the lyrics did not go in um, and neither did the, the other video. So that, that those are what, what happened, but again, subject to argument and actually subject to each case itself. So just something to, to, to reflect upon there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stella. Um, that, very interesting. A couple of questions will arise from that, but I think what we'll do um, is we'll move on to Shahida and see if we've got time at the end of the session. So um, introducing next Shahida Begum, also a member of the criminal uh, defence team at Garden Court. Uh, Shahida has a, a similar practice, I, I think she would agree, to Stella's, uh, has had broad experience of representing youths and indeed young adults across the spectrum of criminal offending and in particular alleged violent offending. And in that context, Shahida has uh, had cause to challenge the admissibility of both drill music videos and gang evidence. Um, notably, uh, I've already said, joint enterprise uh, uh, frequently arises, it frequently is, run, runs alongside this um, type of evidence. And Shahida was instructed in the case of Crown against McGill, um, which was a post jogi decision and a guideline authority on the need to consider the effective participation of youths in the uh, trial process. Um, Shahida has also worked at a school in East London as a mentor, and she's currently part of an initiative to encourage children from East London to consider careers in technology called the Inventors Club. And so over to you, Shahida, for your uh, talk, and I think you're going to give us some more case study material. Thank you very much, Judy, and thank you very much for everyone who's attending. Um, that's right. I'm going to give my thoughts generally about the topic as a defence practitioner and then look at two cases that I was involved in that hopefully cover some of the factors and issues you may want to consider if it, um, you encounter these cases also. I do have a PowerPoint, which I will just put on screen. One moment. There we go. And as I said, one of the things that I'm going to be talk about is my thoughts generally on the topic as a defense practitioner. And as you can see, I've posed the question, why drill? Because one of the difficulties or frustrations that I have when I'm dealing with these cases is that there's a bit of an unreality about the whole process. Um, a lot of realities about society seem to exist outside the courtroom door, but are completely ignored within the courtroom. And these are things that will seem very obvious, no doubt, to a lot of you. Um, but there seems to be either sometimes an ignorance of these issues or an unwillingness to acknowledge these issues and how it might affect the criminal justice process. Firstly, society has always had a problem with new music genres. Whether it's Elvis shaking his leg a bit too vig vigorously, whether it's punk music and its associated fashion, hip hop or gangster rap, and it just so happens to be that now the spotlight is on drill. Secondly, whenever you have a new music genre, of course it has to be shocking because it has to be different. It has to have a different energy. Um, and that's not just specific to music. That's the same in art, in movies, all different art forms. Thirdly, sex, drugs, and violence is popular in mainstream society. It's something that features in some of the biggest TV shows Game of Thrones, The Wire, etc. Music, of course, literature, crime fiction, even operas. It's something either on its own or in combination features in a lot of 
the art forms that we as a society are surrounded by. That doesn't mean that the producers or consumers of these art forms have any criminal tendencies at all. It just so happens that it is popular. And we as a society, and particularly in the criminal justice system, need to acknowledge that, especially the fact that youths are surrounded by all of these factors in our society. Fourthly, new genres over time become mainstream. Um, they reach massive audiences, and some of these artists, in fact, become household names. And I've got three examples, and I have taken it from hip hop, but that's only because it's something I relatively know something about. Um, but you could probably use, have examples from any other genre um, over time. And the reason why I've used hip hop as well is because you may see that it might, it's a useful comparison to drill music. So this is the first example, and you can, I'm not going to obviously attempt at all to read this out. You can read it for yourselves and you can play along at home or anyone who is particularly quick can put it in the chat. But as you can see, the lyrics, there's references to murder rap, AK-47s, possibly a firearm, if it, depending on how you interpret the lyrics. Um, and that was, um, that was sung by none other than Ice Cube, who is now a Hollywood hero. He features in comedy movies with Kevin Hart, playing undercover officers, and this film in particular, in the box office, took $150 million. The next example. Again, although the terminology might be slightly different to the UK terminology we have in drill music, similar themes, similar words, and that was sung by none other than Nas, who is very critically acclaimed within the world of hip hop, frequently voted as one of the best hip hop artists of all time, over 25 million records sold worldwide. And then my particular favorite, the next one, this was in fact from a collaboration, similar sort of um, lyrics about weapons, swearing and so forth. Um, and that is by the new face of just Eat, Snoop Dogg, who over lockdown, no doubt you'll have seen all the adverts, and he's now writing cookbooks and also involved in numerous other businesses. And so my point generally and reflecting what my difficulty and frustration sometimes is when this topic comes up, is that bearing all those things in mind, it seems to be particularly unfair. And again, this is leaving aside the group where there may be lyrics that are extremely probative. Leaving aside that, it seems particularly unfair for this new genre of music and this new snapshot in time in society being used to criminalize a particular cohort of society. And there's no ignoring the fact that the cohort of society that is being criminalized is young black males. So that's just something for you to consider. And some of it I know seems very obvious, but unfortunately I have had experiences at court where it's either doesn't seem to be obvious or there is an unwillingness to acknowledge that this is the society that we live in and what is popular. So moving on then to my first case study, um, and again, the, all the legal framework is in the handout. We thought it'd be actually perhaps more interesting and useful for us to talk about our experiences. Um, and this case hopefully covers quite a lot of the relevant issues. So this case involved a complainant who was not in a gang. He was walking along with three female friends in a high street in South London. He was approached by two black males who were cycling past. They called him over. There was a general discussion about whether the complainant had any cannabis. 
Um, there was some small talk about who he is and who he knows in the area. He mentioned a particular name, which made the atmosphere a bit tense. Um, and also there was a mention between the two cyclists about whether the complainant might be an op, which I'm sure, again, most people who are on this seminar will know that mean, can mean opposition. But there was no other references, no other references to gangs or anything like that. The complainant became a bit nervous and said that he was going to call a friend of his and reached into his pocket. As he did so, again, no threats or anything like that, um, one of the cyclists stabbed the complainant in the stomach and then both the cyclists rode off. The charge was attempted murder and in the alternative, causing grievous bodily harm with intent. This all happened at winter in the night time and it was raining. Um, the co-defendant accepted he was present. He is very distinctive, quite light skinned and three out of the possible five witnesses identified him. The prosecution alleged that my client was the stabber. Only one witness out of five positively identified him. And that one witness was the furthest away, needed glasses for vision and wasn't wearing them at the time. Um, the four out of five of the witness said that the stabber was distinctly Somali. My client was not a Somali male. My client's case was that in fact, he wasn't even in London at all that night. Um, he was outside of London and he provided the location. And true enough, when the cell site was checked, his phone was cell sited to lo a location outside of London. But the prosecution mounted a case theory that he must have left his phone behind and he must have been with the co-defendant um, and they must have been out looking for somebody to stab. Even though that theory did not seem to be supported by the evidence at all. Also, it was quite a weak identification case. And one would hope that in light of the duties on prosecution council and um, other prosecution agencies, that it's not a case of conviction at all costs. And it has to be about fairness. Uh, that they would have exercised some sort of caution over the bad character material they wanted to use. But unfortunately, it was a bit of a kitchen sink approach. Um, they tried to rely on seven different strands of bad character material, whether it was gangs, material on phones, Facebook, um, including three drill videos. And the gateways that they did it under was important explanatory evidence. Um, luckily, the judge gave that very short shrift and said, it's a very straightforward case in terms of what happened on the actual day of the incident. And the issue in the case was identification. There was nothing in any of those music videos that would have helped the jury understand the case. They could understand the case without it. The judge did, however, take seriously their application under subsection D that there was an issue between the defendant and the prosecution. Um, and they had to rely on unlikelihood of coincidence because my client had barely any previous convictions to speak on, let alone any for violence. And the challenge that we mounted um, is we went through it in a stage by stage process. The, these videos in particular were entirely irrelevant. They weren't in a permissible form because they contained hearsay and there was no proper expert evidence in relation to them that could give it any meaning. It didn't satisfy the statute gateways. They didn't satisfy section 78 and they had given insufficient notice because it was absolute chaos, the way that the material had all been served. And so if I just summarize briefly in relation to the three videos, what happened and the specifics of it. The first video that they relied on was uploaded two months after the incident. My client doesn't feature in the video at all. 
um, there was a vague reference to my client by somebody else having been involved in a stabbing. No time, no place, no details about the male who was rapping. And frankly, I had to say to prosecution counsel that my view was it was completely absurd. I could not see how that would assist the jury at all meet any of the great gateways and is patently unfair. And through negotiation, we were able to, uh, the prosecution did abandon the air attempt to adduce that video. The second video, my client was alleged to feature, not rapping, not holding any weapons, simply an extra in the background. But in relation to that video, eight others had been charged with a public order offence. Um, the police had placed my client under investigation for that video, but it had been several months had passed and no charge had arisen. Um, so again, I, had, I submitted, they would have been completely inappropriate for the prosecution to try to take advantage of the situation in those circumstances um, and ask him questions about it during the trial process. It would lead to satellite litigation and in any event, he's not actually doing anything in the video at all. So again, how does it assist the jury whether that one witness who wasn't wearing her glasses at the time has made the right identification or not? Then there was the third video, which was the real fight in the case, because in that um, video, my client was rapping and there was a dispute about the lyrics and whether some of the lyrics referred to a stabbing or not. That video had about 100,000 plus views on YouTube. It was very professionally produced. There's a production team that does these videos that the police had not contacted. My client was very young, but it was quite clear to me because his phone was served as unused material. Having looked at that material, he was taking music, drill music, very seriously. That was his passion. Um, and in fact, it reminded me of an artist's notebook because there were half written lyrics in some of his messages, in some of his notes, voice notes, discussions with his friends about lyrics. This was somebody who was hoping to be a professional drill artist. Um, obviously, I made all of those submissions and those submissions, I, I think there was sort of less reluctance on the part of the court to accept and perhaps was more powerful was that in relation to the video, it was quite impossible to actually hear or work out what was actually being said. The prosecution had served three different versions of the transcript. The first one had come from the complainant's family. The second one had come from the OIC in the case. And then the final one, when they finally worked out that actually you can't admit evidence in this way and it has to come from an expert, they found a local officer purporting to be an expert to give his version, which was different to the other two, about what he thought he could hear and what he thought certain words meant. This had all been done extremely late. We didn't have a time. There was a dispute about the lyrics. We had no time to instruct our own expert. Um, and coming back to all the ordinary principles of fairness um, in Hansen, Turnbull, and so forth, we were able to exclude um, that evidence. And it was very fortunate that we did because it was, it did transpire to be a really finely balanced case. So just summarizing um, going through then, having been through the three videos and the kind of issues that arose, it's always worth thinking about what type of evidence is it? Does it contain hearsay? Does it require expert evidence? Does it meet the requirements of expert evidence? And there's a really useful case of Myers, and I've given the paragraph reference. The actual threshold for a police officer to become an expert is very high. Does it require instruction of a defense expert? For instance, someone like Kieran, 
And has sufficient notice been given? Because often the prosecution do make these applications very late and in a chaotic manner. The, if it hasn't been, um, if sufficient notice hasn't been given, um, and the defence don't have enough opportunity to challenge it, such as instructing an expert, um, then the evidence shouldn't go in and you just should fall on the procedural ground before you even get to the substantive issues. These were the sections that we relied on. I don't need to go through them because I'm sure you're all familiar with them and they're in the um, handout. Um, and again, it's worth bearing in mind, there, are the, there is the case law on drill music, but what I found really helpful was actually to go back to good old fashioned Hansen and Turnbull, because Turnbull is an identification case which outlines some of the kind of evidence which can be used to corroborate a weak ID. And one of my submissions was, this isn't the kind of evidence, this drill music, that can support a weak identification. It doesn't meet the very high threshold of Turnbull. And, those are, and then there are two other cases, one McAllister's about the unlikelihood of coincidence, and Omotoso is a case that's about where bad character can tip a finely balanced case in the wrong direction, it shouldn't be omitted. So actually just general bad character cases and general principles are sometimes a lot more helpful. Bringing people back, leaving aside that it's drill, just well, what is the evidence? And what did the prosecution want to use it for? Is it fair? This is actually a case that I came across whilst I was doing that case. It actually relates to sentencing and it's, a, it's an old case, so it's not sometimes that well known, but I thought it was quite useful because it was about, because sometimes even if drill videos are not admitted during the trial, they, the police may seek to use them during the um, sentencing process. Um, and it gives some guidance about what the police can and can't say if that's the um, occasion that it happens. So again, these are some of the factors, the kind of process that we went through to try and exclude this evidence. And the only one that I will highlight is, well, is there, what do the prosecution want it for? And is there another way of dealing with it? Because one of the things that the prosecution said is they want to show association. Well, that was never disputed. So I was more than happy to have an agreed fact that the defendants know each other. You didn't need a very prejudicial music video where they're both in it to establish that very simple fact. So coming on then to case B very briefly, um, and this is an example of where drill music can be, have probative value. This was a murder case. There was a group of youths who traveled from one area to another. Um, they see a group from an opposing area. They did a loop around the block. They came out of the car, gave chase. Unfortunately, one of the youths from the opposing group fell over. He was caught, he got stabbed and he, he died. There were music videos in that case, but with the agreement between all the parties, including the prosecution, it was agreed that, in fact, the actual videos themselves added nothing at all to the case. The prosecution did rely on a video recording of a music video being produced in the opposing area on a co-defendant's phone, um, which did have probative value. There was a dispute between the defendants, my client, and the second defendant, who was the driver of the car. My client stated that he wasn't there at the scene of the incident at all. The driver of the car stated my client was there. Um, and in fact, he, the driver, had nothing to do with the stabbing, didn't know it was going to happen. So obviously there was a dispute between the parties. And in fact, we did adduce the lyrics on his phone um, to cross-examine him because what he had described, the lyrics that he had written on his phone was very similar to what in fact had taken place as um, including going around the block and there was a nexus in time. 
Now, in that case, again, there was, it was a very narrow selection of material. There was lots of material on the phone, but there was a, um, an agreement that it should just be this very narrow selection of material, that something that could assist the jury, um, rather than throwing in everything, which would cert almost certainly be prejudicial and not assist the jury. The other team did not object to the material, um, but there will be cases, of course, where even if it is a co-defendant trying to adduce the material, you may want to object. And although the fairness test doesn't apply, all the other factors are worth considering. Does it require expert evidence? Is it hearsay? You know, is there a nexus? Is it probative? Um, and those challenges can still be made. And the last slide is just the, cut, the relevant um, sections from section 101, where there is an application between co-defendants. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shahida. Um, well, unfortunately, we're just um, over time for questions. Can I first of all extend my thanks to all of the panelists? I found all of the talks really interesting, the slides and the material were all very valuable, and I'm sure that the attendees have all found that really interesting and useful. Um, just one question, because it's a practical one. Some questions were philosophical and others were rhetorical, but there was one practical one, and I'm going to ask Shahida, because you've been mentioning experts. Um, the question was, can we get prior authority and legal aid to instruct um, experts to get reports and assessments? And I think the short answer is yes. Yes, and in fact, before, in the preparation of this seminar, there was actually email discussion where Eleanor has experience of getting expert, actually. So if I could actually hand over to Eleanor to answer the I, question. I think, I think what we can do, if Eleanor's happy with this, is we can circulate that to all of the delegates, some practical information on how to get an expert on board in these types of cases. Is that okay, Eleanor? Are you happy with that? Okay, I'm just conscious that we're over time now. And um, I just, aside from thanking all of the panellists, want to thank all of the delegates for attending and to let you know that the next webinar, part three, is on drill injunctions and, as, and ancillary orders. And that's the same time next week, five o'clock until 6.30 or perhaps a little after that. So 22nd of September, make sure you have that date in your diaries. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Have a good evening.